you're alone, sitting in a submarine. It's not made of metal, and there's no nuclear power to drive it along. It's just a small wooden sphere sitting beneath the surface of New York Harbor. Above you, a British warship looms, hulking, still unaware. Around you, water presses in from all sides. Inside, there's barely enough room to move. You crank a propeller by foot pedals, inching forward in near total darkness. The only air you have is what you brought in with you, and the clock is ticking. You are inside the Turtle, the world's first combat submarine. It could stay underwater for less than 30 minutes. That was the limit. Your mission, sneak under the ship and plant a time-delayed explosive on its hull. It's a bold idea, but there's no engine, no oxygen system, and even a way to aim. The Turtle failed. It couldn't drill into the hull of the British warship because it was copper sheathed. And because they had limited oxygen, they had to abandon the mission and release the explosive charge harmlessly into the harbour. For the next two centuries, navies tried everything so they could stay underwater for longer. Crankshafts, steam engines, diesel electric systems, chemical scrubbers. But the same problem always surfaced. Sooner or later, the submarine had to come up. Until one day, it didn't. Working out how to stay underwater for long periods of time changed everything. It became so effective that today, they aren't just used for sneaking up on boats and planting bombs. They can influence world politics and sway nations. But before we get to that, let's find out the secret they unlocked that allows them to stay hidden for months at a time. Nearly two centuries after the turtle, the USS Nautilus slipped into the water. Not powered by muscle or diesel, but by something entirely new. A nuclear reactor. This was more than a propulsion breakthrough. It marked a turning point in naval history. For the first time, a submarine could stay submerged for weeks. Not because it held its breath longer, but because it no longer needed to breathe. Nautilus shattered endurance records, crossed the Arctic beneath the ice, and proved that nuclear power wasn't just possible, it was the future. It laid the foundation for every modern submarine that followed. But what actually makes a nuclear submarine run? And when your entire life depends on a thin wall of steel, you'd better understand how that wall works. On this channel, we're always pulling things apart, understanding the systems behind ships and the marine world around us. But it made us wonder, if everything we depend on vanished tomorrow, power, food, infrastructure, how much could we rebuild from scratch? The book, the ultimate guide to rebuilding a civilization, has some surprising answers. And it's today's sponsor, but we'll show you more later on in the video. It hums beneath your feet, no louder than a refrigerator, and yet this machine powers everything. In the early days of atomic research, scientists discovered that splitting the atom releases a huge amount of energy. That energy could be turned into electricity. And for more than 70 years, nuclear power plants have been using it to power homes, cities, and industries around the world. Similarly, each nuclear submarine draws power from its own miniature onboard nuclear reactor. Every atom has an atomic nucleus, made of protons and neutrons. The number of protons defines what chemical element that atom belongs to. Nuclei with the same number of protons, but varying numbers of neutrons are called isotopes of that element. Some very heavy nuclei are highly susceptible to a process known as nuclear fission, whereby they split into two lighter nuclei with a total mass less than the original nucleus. The remainder is converted into energy. The amount of energy released is immense, as we can see from Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared, which tells us the energy is equal to the change in mass multiplied by the square of the speed of light. At the heart of every nuclear submarine lies a sealed reactor core, which is shielded, pressurized, and built to run silently for decades. Inside, rods of enriched uranium-235 are arranged in precise patterns. It is then bombarded with neutrons, causing some of the nuclei inside its atoms to undergo nuclear fission, releasing heat and more neutrons, which strike again, causing a chain reaction. But that reaction needs to be controlled. So, the uranium is surrounded by a moderator, usually water, to slow down those neutrons. Fast neutrons race past uranium nuclei. Slower ones stick. That's what keeps the reaction stable and efficient. This water, heated by fission, becomes the primary coolant loop. 
It circulates under pressure so it doesn't boil, carrying heat from the core to a heat exchanger. Inside the heat exchanger, that heat is passed to a separate water system, the secondary loop. And once there, the water is allowed to boil. It flashes into high-pressure steam, which spins a turbine, and that turbine drives the submarine's propeller and generates electricity for every onboard system. Most submarines use a pressurised water reactor, or PWR, because it's compact, proven and safe. It is the industry standard. But pressurised water isn't the only way to cool a nuclear reactor. Some submarines, especially older or experimental models, have used natural circulation reactors. These systems rely on basic physics. Hot water rises, cold water sinks. Then there's the liquid metal reactor, where molten metal, like sodium or lead, replaces water as the coolant. Metal carries far more heat than water, allowing for smaller turbines and more compact reactors. But it comes at a price. Molten metals are reactive, especially sodium. If they leak, they can ignite on contact with air or water. They also become highly radioactive over time, making containment far more critical. But what if the system cools down too far? Well, the metal solidifies inside the pipes, blocking the entire reactor in place. So, while liquid metal reactors offer intriguing advantages, they demand extreme precision and are rarely used in frontline naval vessels. That's why most naval reactors stick with water. It's a simple heatsink, a moderator and a coolant. With this setup, a single uranium core, about the size of a large desk, can power a submarine for 20 years or more without ever being refuelled. As long as the systems stay running, the submarine can stay down as long as needed. That is, assuming they have enough air to do that. You can't stockpile three months of breathable air or fresh water for a hundred people. Not without turning the vessel into a floating warehouse. So. Instead, the submarine makes them. The atmosphere inside the submarine is a carefully engineered system, sealed, pressurised and constantly monitored. Every breath a crew member takes consumes oxygen. Every exhale adds carbon dioxide. And in a sealed steel tube, that balance matters more than anywhere else. To supply fresh oxygen, the submarine makes oxygen by using a process called electrolysis. Seawater is brought in from outside the hull filtered, pressurised and stripped of particulates. Before anything touches the electrolysis system, it passes through a series of desalination filters and deionizers to remove salt, minerals and microscopic impurities. The goal is to deliver pure water, chemically stable, clean and ready to be split. Water, as you might remember, is H2O, two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen. The electric current in the electrolytic cell breaks those bonds, splitting the molecules into pure oxygen and hydrogen gas. The oxygen stays on board. It is fed into the ventilation system, blending into the air supply. The hydrogen? Vented overboard, carefully diluted into the surrounding sea to prevent any risk of flammable buildup. It's chemistry, engineering and environmental control, all working in silence, deep beneath the waves. Also, the system must carefully control the voltage, temperature and salinity of the input water. If not, it can corrode equipment, or worse, produce a dangerous gas mix. On top of that, the submarine's partial pressure of oxygen, which is a critical measure of how well oxygen is able to move from the lungs into the bloodstream, is kept between strict limits. Too little, and the crew begins to suffer from hypoxia, confusion, fatigue, even unconsciousness. Too much, oxygen becomes toxic, increasing the risk of fire and long-term health effects. So, it's constantly adjusted, in every compartment, every hour. The submarine literally manufactures breathable air, but air is only half the equation. A typical submarine crew uses tons of fresh water every day, for drinking, cooking, cleaning and cooling. Carrying that much is impossible. Once again, the submarine collects seawater, this time to be converted into fresh water. Onboard distillation plants heat the seawater until it turns to steam, separating out salt and impurities again. The vapour is condensed back into liquid and stored as drinkable water. 
Some modern subs also use reverse osmosis, forcing seawater through high-pressure membranes that filter out salt on a molecular level. So, you have power, air and water. But what about food? Every box of rice, can of beans, slice of bread is loaded onto the sub before departure. For a mission that lasts three months, feeding a crew of 130, that means nearly 20 tonnes of stored provisions. Most of it is vacuum sealed, dehydrated or canned. Fresh produce is stacked into every available corner and used up quickly, usually within the first week. After that, it's shelf-stable meals. Rehydrated stews, powdered eggs, frozen meat and enough coffee to keep everyone human. The galley, what you might call the submarine kitchen, is small but remarkably efficient. It runs 24-7 because the crew runs in shifts. Some are waking up, others are heading to bed and everyone wants hot food when they can get it. Storage is everywhere, under bunks, behind walls, inside deck compartments. On some boats, the floor of the torpedo room is stacked with food crates at the beginning of a patrol. There's no resupply or emergency Uber Eats at 300 meters depth. When the food runs out, the mission ends. And that's why food, not fuel, is the ultimate limiting factor for how long a submarine can stay underwater. Imagine living in a place with no windows. No sunlight, no rain, no wind, just artificial lights, recycled air, constant humming. Welcome to life on a nuclear submarine. For the crew, a long patrol means weeks, sometimes months, without ever seeing the sky. The pressure outside is crushing. The pressure inside is psychological. Most crew members work in rotating shifts, following an 18-hour cycle. Sleep, eat, work, repeat, regardless of whether it's night or day above the surface. In many subs, bunks are hot-racked, meaning one bed is shared between two or three sailors, who use it in turns, of course. To maintain alertness and morale, routines are everything. Exercise bikes and rowing machines are wedged into corners, mounted on special supports that reduce the noise. Movies play in the mess hall over headphones, birthdays are celebrated with canned cake and recycled jokes. A noise discipline is sacred. Every dropped wrench, every slammed hatch, every footstep on steel can echo into the ocean, where passive sonar may be listening. There's even an unspoken code. Move quietly, speak clearly, and always know where you are. The people on board are engineers, electricians, sonar techs, cooks, medics, and navigators. But they're also psychologists teammates and guardians of each other's sanity. When the outside world disappears, the only world left is the one you make together, which is ironic given what these submarines are for. Nuclear-powered submarines are a key part of what's known as the nuclear triad, the three methods by which a nation can deliver a nuclear strike. Land-based missiles, air-launched bombs, and submarine-launched ballistic missiles. Each leg of the triad has strengths and weaknesses, but submarines are by far the most survivable. Once submerged, they can stay hidden for months, anywhere in the world, and that makes them almost impossible to target. That's why ballistic missile submarines, SSBNs, are considered the ultimate second strike weapon. If everything else is destroyed in a surprise attack, a single hidden submarine can still respond. That possibility alone makes a first strike nearly unthinkable. But not all nuclear submarines are armed with nuclear weapons. Some, like attack submarines, are built for tracking enemy vessels, gathering intelligence and launching cruise missiles. They use nuclear power for range and endurance, not for payload. In both cases, the key is persistence. These submarines can operate undetected near hostile shores, under polar ice or in contested choke points, waiting listening and ready to act. The fact that no one knows where they are, that's part of the strategy. One vessel, an unknown location and entire nations hold their breath. We talk a lot about systems, how they're built, how they fail, how they improve them. 
The book takes that same idea and applies it to the entire human project. Imagine waking up one day to a blank slate. No power grid, no clean water, no working factories. The ultimate guide to rebuilding a civilization is really what the title promises. A hand-drawn survival manual that walks you through the process of rebuilding. From forging metal and purifying water to recreating machines, medicines, even navigation systems. And tucked inside, within its margins and beautiful illustrations, is something more. A secret quest woven with symbols and puzzles for you to solve as you learn. We found diagrams on early propulsion, sealed chambers, and even the fundamentals behind firearms, armor, and tanks. The kind of knowledge that makes you rethink how we build safe, self-contained systems in the first place. Use code NAVIGATION10 for 10% off and get your copy through the link in the description. If you like this video, but you're wondering why movies can only be watched using headphones, click the link above to see part one in this series. Thank you to all our patrons, and see you next time.